In order, if there are no further points of order, I think we come now to the 10 minute rule motion. Mr. Steve McCabe. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move that leave be given for me to bring in a bill for the protection of family homes, enforcement and permitted development. Mr Speaker, the Selyoke village and Bornbrook parts of my constituency were particularly attractive places. They were once full of small terrace and other family homes within a series of quiet interlocking tree-lined streets. Nowadays, a walk down Hubert, Tynemouth or Dawlish Road reveals a very different scene. One is visually assaulted by a series of to-let boards of all shapes and sizes installed at all angles. The streets, pavements and small front gardens are littered with skips, builders' rubble, sand and cement, and there is a constant noise at all hours, including weekends, of additional bedrooms being hammered and bolted onto existing dwellings. Where once we could expect to see rows of small family homes, we now witness architectural carbuncles jutting at odd angles, extending into adjacent houses and covering rear gardens with additional bedrooms, variously described as sheds, games rooms and saunas. Mr Speaker, my local authority seems powerless to arrest this destruction. They say enforcement action is costly and the guidance from central government is unclear. Enforcement action, as you know, is discretionary and local authorities are required to act proportionately. Birmingham City Council has advised me that there has been no policy on their part to limit the number of planning enforcement cases they pursue but I note there has been a steady reduction in recent years. To be fair, they have initiated a limited Article 4 direction covering a small part of my constituency, which means that planning permission is needed before a family house can be converted into a house in multiple occupation for up to six people, what I understand to be a change from a Class 3 to a Class 4. Yes. But, Mr Speaker, the problems continue, and it is not confined to one area of my constituency, or indeed to one part of Birmingham, but is an issue which affects many towns and cities across the country, as I think is evidenced by the broad support for this Bill. Examples of these problems include Mr and Mrs White, a retired couple who I believe are in the gallery today. The developer who bought the house next door commenced an extension that effectively changed their detached home into a semi-detached property as the roof extension expanded to sit on top of their roof and guttering. The Council failed to take enforcement action despite work commencing without planning approval and being beyond the scope of permitted development. A surveyor's report has indicated the damage that has been done to the external wall of their home. This has cost them thousands of pounds in court fees, and as yet the problem continues. In Tiverton Road, Mrs O'Sullivan complained that the work on an extension, which included digging up the foundations in a shared alleyway, had commenced without planning permission. The Council agreed to investigate, but advised in advance, and I quote, in deciding whether it would be expedient to take enforcement action, the Council has to take into account whether any breach of planning control unacceptably affects public amenity or the use of land and buildings which should be protected in the public interest. In this case, the extension was not covered by permitted development regulations and needed planning approval. Nonetheless, the Council judged that the risk to Mrs O'Sullivan's property constituted limited harm and her loss of light did not justify action. In Bornbrook Road, a constituent complained about a landlord's development that exceeded the dimensions on the plan available on the Council website 
but was told that officers had concluded that it was not expedient to take any action. In Gristort Road, Ms Tempest complained that the Britannia Group continued to build extensions designed to convert existing homes into eight-bedroom properties, despite planning permission being refused. Elsewhere in Gristort Road, cowboy builders demolished without permission the chimneys and gas flues which supported the gas fire of an elderly couple, putting them at serious risk. And at another property, when a constituent complained, the council admitted that a three-level development overlooking his garden and those of his neighbours was completed with disregard to the Article 4 direction and without permission. I could go on, Mr Speaker. I have case after case here of rogue developers and cowboy builders doing as they please. All of these cases are about ordinary people who have worked and saved for their family home, only to find landlords and developers working hand in glove with cowboy builders, buying up nearby properties and turning their road or street into a series of mini hostels. It's no surprise that the value of their properties begin to plummet to the point where the only one buying is yet another developer, and so the cycle begins again. As I've been investigating this issue, I've become aware of an unintended consequence of the permitted development arrangements. I want to be clear that I have nothing against permitted development and welcome the government's good intentions in trying to make it easier for people to make small alterations or additions to their home. But I'm not sure that the government ever intended that this permission would be exploited by ruthless landlords and developers destroying family homes and bringing misery to thousands of ordinary families and retired couples like the Whites. The local authority advises me that the changes in the law mean that many agents and individual owners are unclear about, about what they can and cannot build, and strangely those who advise the rogue landlords always err on the side of ever greater expansion. And so today, my 10-minute rule bill seeks to achieve four things. Firstly, it calls for the Department for Communities and Local Government to produce clearer guidance for planning authorities on when enforcement action should be taken, and ask that all local authorities publish an enforcement plan so that grey areas are reduced. Secondly, it calls for a simple right of appeal for those who are the victims of this rogue building where the local authority concludes that it is not expedient to act. Thirdly, it asks that these extensions should be independently checked against building regulations to make sure they are safe. At present, there is nothing to stop a rogue developer employing his or her own inspector to sign off the dodgy work done by his or her team of cowboy builders. If we do not act on this, a tragedy will surely follow. And finally, it calls on the government to consider the introduction of fixed penalty fines to serve as a deterrent against the action of rogue developers, such penalties to be modelled on those the government already proposes in Clause 86 of the Housing and Planning Bill to deal with rogue landlords. This 10-minute rule bill calls for a modest number of changes designed to protect family homes, address the enforcement problems and ease the position on permitted development so that once again it fulfils the aspirations of government ministers without giving a licence to ride roughshod over local people and destroy family homes and local communities. I commend it to the House. Order. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as I have that opinion say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare and bring in the bill? Paul Bloomfield, Nigel Evans, Michael Fabricant, Diana Johnson, Norman Lamb, Shabana Mahmood, Greg Mulholland, Jess Phillips, Alan Whitehead, and myself, Mr. Speaker. Who's moving the motion? Is it Brendan O'Hara? Brendan O'Hara. 
Yes, sir. Mr. Steve McCabe. Protection of Family Homes Enforcement and Permitted Development Bill. Second reading what day? 29th of January 2016, sir. 29th of January 2016. Thank you. Order. We come now to...